North Branch Nature Center. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, so I, I met Jesse a few months ago, and I realized uh, pretty quickly after meeting her that I was one of the last people in central Vermont to meet Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and when she came in on her way to my office, she gave a hug to the other like 13 people in this building. Um, and so it's a pleasure to finally get to meet you guys from Boston. And, uh, and I, I suspect that um, that uh, you're all, many of you are here because um, you all know how great Jesse is as a human being, as an herbalist, as an artist. But tonight is all about art, and um, I am not going to spend too much time introducing Jesse um, because I like let her introduce herself. However, um, we are really pleased that we have this new space. The space is less than two years old, and we have uh, we're just now this year kind of launching it as this rotating gallery space. So we're, we're really happy to see that the Montpelier community um, has really taken to this space quickly and is really um, you know coming out to see the work that we have um, in here. So. Um, if you have suggestions of, of folks that you would like to see uh, exhibiting in this space, um, let us know. Uh, this, is, this is your space as much as, as, as it is ours. Um, so uh, Jesse uh, put together this work um, through her fellowship with United Plant Savers, an organization dedicated to um, conserving uh, medicinal endangered plants um, in, in the United States. Um, and so. Um, in addition to enjoying the works here, you can take some of it home. Um, if you want to purchase any cards or any prints or any of the pieces or anything like that, um, just find me uh, afterwards and I can um, help you take care of all that. But all of the, you know, the prices and, and all the stuff that's available, the cards and whatnot, are kind of in the back corner of that room. Without further ado, help me welcome Jesse Velasco. Thank you every single person for being here. This is just overwhelming. It's beautiful. Um, Sean, thank you for accepting this work. And thank you to Emily Sloan and Emily Seifert, who are not here but have been running things with the, the display and selling goods while I'm not here. I wanted to thank my very good friend, Elena, and her daughter, Flora, for helping me hang the show. And this place is made for art. It's really set up now that if someone wants to do a show, it's fairly simple. Everything, the hooks and everything are all, it's really nice. So if you have art to hang, it's a great place. And Julie Meadows, and I don't know if she's here, but she um, lent a very important book to me for the show out in the, in the hall. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro. I just wanted to tell you how the flow is. I know some people said they had to leave at certain times. Don't worry about it. If you have to get up and go, that's fine. It's going to be about 20 minutes. Um, I am going to do an introductory, a little short film clip of United Plant Savers. My experience there, I'm going to talk about the art and weave poetry in, and then questions if there are any. Okay? So I asked Rosemary Gladstar to be here, but she couldn't. And she is the founder of United Plant Savers. So the, the story of United Plant Savers begins with pioneering American herbalist Rosemary Gladstar. A deep love of, of observing plants defined her childhood as an adult. She found her calling in herbalism. Renowned in the herbal community as a healer, teacher, and visionary, Rosemary founded the California School of Herbal Studies in Forestville, California, and later Sage Mountain in eastern Vermont. Growing concern about the over-harvesting of medicinal plants, Rosemary and other plant enthusiasts founded United Plant Savers in East Barrie, Vermont in 1994. Since then, the organization has expanded to southeastern Ohio and encompasses groups across the country. Now in its 24th year, UPS continues to be a voice for native medicinal plant conservation and appreciation. By continuing to grow its membership and expanding its efforts for education, advocacy, and outreach, the nonprofit is protecting endangered medicinal plants one species at a time. I'd like to call up Betsy Bancroft to talk about the mission. So I, I, I was the office manager for United Plant Savers for 10 years when it was at Sage Mountain, and I'm still on their advisory board. So 
And I'd been to the sanctuary multiple times, and then going back in um, September, they, we have built a educational center, and the grand opening for that is in September. So we're we're uh, having a road trip, <laughs> a bunch of herbalists. It would be really really fun. But the the mission of United Plant Savers is, as Rosemary and other herbalists, as, as Jesse said, recognize that the plentifulness of our native medicinal plants was, was uh, declining, you know, from echinacea in the prairies to ginseng in the forests here in the east and so forth. So United Plant Savers mission is the conservation of those plants and their habitat, because plants are nothing without the places that they grow. And uh, a large, in large measure, education about sustainable use. Um, so some of the plants are officially endangered, like ginseng and golden seal, but many of them are considered at risk. Um, so yeah, habitats and the conservation of the plants for North America generally, um, Canada, United States, and they have multiple programs around that. There's a botanical sanctuary network, there's um, internships, there's uh, educational events, and educational materials to, again, raise consciousness among people who are purchasing and using herbs so that we can do that with, um, with good consciousness and sustainability in mind. So thank you so much for bringing us here. Yay, thanks thank friends. You, thank you. This is one of the foremost of the big herbs, and to me the big herbs are our trees. These trees make it possible to have all these understory herbs, because these understory herbs in the 50 to 60 percent, 70 percent shade. The majority of these herbs that are out in these hills are plants that have a long history of human interaction. It's flower buds. We are a part of that community. We are part of what has taken place in the history of those plants on this planet. And there's a relationship that's been built there between human beings and these medicinal herbs. They've been used for a very long time. When you're harvesting at an angle, water will less likely sit here and create you know, mildew or disease. That human interaction, that loving touch, is really a part of their survival now. It's integrated. It has become a mutualistic relationship. In indigenous cultures around the world, they would have these areas in their communities that would be kind of considered sacred groves. And that would really be an area where people in those communities knew that they weren't supposed to cut trees, that they weren't supposed to take from that area because that was really their source of those hard to find native medicinal plants that were really important to those communities and I, I feel like we've lost that. There's a small area on this land that was never logged and that was really that concept of the sacred grove to the people who lived in this community. They knew not to harm that area because many people would go there to harvest medicinal plants. And then you've got part of the land that's been logged, strip mined, and yet has returned. So it, it really has that healing feeling that if we protect areas that are intact, then that vitality can spread out and heal those areas that have been damaged. Well, I haven't taken the life of that plant. I've borrowed its root. I'm going to plant this plant back. It's all right. You can just keep that back in the ground a little bit. Any place you can get under. We cannot take without giving back. There must be reciprocity. There must be exchange. And what we value as human beings is not necessarily what is going to be valued in the natural world. We have to let nature decide what it ought to receive. And we have to be able to listen. 
There are different ways to see, and most people see like this. They go through life with blinders on, because that's what they need to do. They're focused, they've got a job to do, they've got food to eat. But you know what? First Nations people, this is their office. So when they go through the woods, you look in both directions. You look up, you look down, you look all around. Well, I understood a forest so much better when I understood how to look in a forest. We've had to slow the world down here so these plants can live and they can go through their life cycles as naturally as possible. And putting our, our focus on that, the rest of the forest and, and the wildlife that exists here can follow suit. Everything else around them is also given that space and that time. And then the regeneration and, and the growth and the vitality is given that space and that time. And that, that vitality, it's, it captures the spirit, it captures the soul, it captures something deep, deep, deep down inside our humanity. There's something worth preserving there. There's memory there, there's culture there. And there's a lot of peace and a lot of joy that comes out of, of that preservation and putting your energy into protecting and preserving something so beautiful. If we open our eyes and if we see how these little places of refuge, these sacred groves can then if allowed to heal the areas around them you sort of feel like not only do you get healed internally by walking through these woods but you you walk away i think inspired and hopeful So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience and then weave poetry through that. Um, when I went, it was summer solstice week. So it was lush green, very thick, but no one was on the premises. I was alone. I was shown my quarters in a yurt. I had food and art supplies, and I just plopped myself down and got everything ready and the rain started. The rain came day after day after day that I was there, torrential rains. And you know, the, the dome on the yurt, it just kept playing like a drum song almost. And I had these beautiful like log, log sawn in half tables to work on and that's, I just stayed at it. But I had to go make some kind of contact with the plants so somehow every day there'd be like an opening where it wasn't raining as hard. I'd put my rain gear on and I'd go out and I would just sit with the plants. I would just be like, one would, one would somehow call me. And you know, if you're a gardener, you know how that is. You're just like, oh, this one's really calm. And so I would like study that one more that day and then go back to the year and just really work on it. And I was actually sometimes doing two in a day because it was raining and I couldn't go outside. So I was just like, okay, I just was, you know, really, really concentrating on my art. And in between, I would write poetry when I needed a break from the colors and, and the, the compositions, I'd have to do that. So um, one of the things that is so amazing is that even the plant that wasn't visible Jack in the pulpit was not there. But when I stood by the area where it was, I was like, I have to do Jack in the pulpit. You know? <laughs> and so it was born out of just its its energy because it's still in the ground, you know, it just wasn't above ground. 
And it was really neat. So that became part of the um, series as well. The piece on the wall, medicine, medicine Magic, was just one day I was like, let's just throw things on it. I'm not going to try to be specifically perfect or anything like that. I'm just going to let it go. And I decided that that piece is going to be donated to United Plant Savers. It felt like something communal and something that had a, all the plants in it. And just I felt like that would go to them. So that's, that's for them. Um, I'm going to start with, oh, one other thing I wanted to tell you. The two days before I left to come here, I got a, a letter in the mail from the United States Postal Service saying that these figures, these art pieces, are being considered for United States stamps. So we'll see what happens. It's more about the organization and that it represents, because they want to know that you have a, a something that's worthwhile, not just that you're doing art, but that you're representing something. So we'll see what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to read some poems and, and then talk about the art. The first trail walk. At the entrance, I pass below a wooden arch with carved letters, the medicine trail. Sun moves light and shadows like dancers in between leaves. I absorb sounds of landscape like a spray of wind in a place of primitive voices, watching every move. Birds apprise, and each tree feels my footsteps on its roots. Almost a rainforest, heavy in humidity, hot with hardly a breeze. I fill with gratitude that I can be here, alone, know the alveoli, small trees of my lungs, accept and return air from the trees around me, the rivers that wind through my veins, warm as water under the same sun, medicine and mycelium pulsate like my heart. So um, I start, I'm going to start with blue cohosh. I exaggerated that piece. Those, the blue little seed pods that come from it are not that big relative to the um, leaves, but I like that blue color, so I was <laughs> popping it. Um, but they're used, it's used as a uterine stimulant to bring on suppressed menstruation and for easing menstrual cramps. And it's difficult to propagate having very specific and limited habitat. Um, that place it at risk from collection in the wild. And golden seal is used internally and locally for its antiseptic and antimicrobial actions. A small amount in formulas is used for, for atonic states of the digestive tract and for mucosal inflammations. Overuse and overharvesting for commercial use has disseminated wild populations of this woodland habitat specific rhizome, placing it on the international sites list. Habitat destruction has been a concern for this plant for well over 100 years. It can be cultivated in a woodland setting, so purchasing organically cultivated golden seal and applying it appropriately will help ensure its continued availability as a medicine. And that's one of the things that Betsy was talking about. Botanical sanctuaries, um, if you have land with forest, that is something that is so it's such a contribution to take medicinals that are endangered, cultivate them, keep them growing in our communities as well. And then they're, you know, you're not over harvesting, you're just using them for your specific needs or for your community's need. And they don't have to get them from the wild. Um, and I'm going to stress here that it's so good to have a relationship with the plants, to like go get to know them, get into the woods with them. Um, I didn't know golden seal that well, and after sitting with it and drawing it and um, painting it, I actually had to use it this year. I, I went away, and when I came home, I had stomach problems, and golden seal was the remedy. And I felt like I had a connection to it as I was taking it. It wasn't some, like, bottle tincture, and that's it. I knew that plant. So it is great to have a connection with it. Um, my second poem is Chosen. 
I have to put my poetry voice on when I do this. Okay. <laughs> As I walk through the woods wondering what to do, breathing so I don't think, feel what arises. Stems seem like necks and leaves are faces. Being watched by plants as I follow signs and wander through trails, it's as if they chose me to be here. Here I am, old as a grandmother, seasoned as an artist, a curious student, determined. I will honor them, adorn their shapes, expose them for their protection. And to my right and left um, is trillium and wild ginger. And the Native Americans used the rhizome as a tea for menstrual disorders, a very female plant, to treat menopause, to induce childbirth, and as a uterine astringent. It was also used for coughs and bowel troubles and as a poultice for tumors and inflammation. The plant is propagated by ants in the wild and may take up to 15 years to flower. Only cultivated roots should be used for medicine today. And with wild ginger, the root is a laxative, stomachic, and tonic. A tea made from the root is used in the treatment of colds, colic, indigestion, and stomach pains. The root is harvested in the autumn and dried for later use. The whole plant is analgesic, anti-rheumatic, appetizer, and tonic. A, a decoction is used externally to treat headaches, intestinal pain, and knee pains. Listening to plants. Have I been a listener who enters in honor of this terrain, who wants my presence to nourish, not disdain? Among this sanctuary of plant beings, I will stray long enough to listen to the roots of what they say. As I listen, I will hear what they intend, undistracted, so as not to offend. It is here where medicines of life gather with families away from strife. For in the world where noise is loud, they need seclusion from the crowds. Keepers of the earth have made this so. Thus plants can show me what I've come to know. So hibiscus is not on the endangered or at risk list. In fact, it's a small little flower that was at the entrance of United Plant Savers, and it just caught my eye that day, and I decided to do it. But it is medicinal, and in fact, the flowers are diuretic. They are used in the treatment of itch and painful skin diseases. The dried leaves are said to be stomachic. In Southern Europe, the leaf is used in, as an expectorant and to treat warts. <laughs> American ginseng is the first plant next to Chris. <laughs> Chris. Um, the root is used as an adaptogenic tonic for mental and nervous exhaust exhaustion from overwork. Was historically used for nervous dyspepsia or digestive weakness from stress. It can take up to seven years before it can produce seeds for reproduction. So the harvesting of small roots is unsustainable to the species. Over-harvesting for the commercial trade for two centuries and loss of critical habitat have contributed to its at-risk status. The Art Fellowship. This is where you're going to see I've been in this yurt too long. <laughs> <laughs> Poems come from the dome in the ceiling of my head. <laughs> Having it slightly open so air seeps in, but not rain. No soggy words, but crisp and unexpected metaphors. Instead of answers, questions about flowers. Not just any flowers, but medicinal ones. How to capture, express their color, execute their lines, stimulate recognition, and make them memorable. How to make them stick so that walking in a field, one recognizes wild ginger, golden seal, and ginseng. There are hundreds of plants that never <coughs> reach our tongue in speech or by spoonful. 
I hope that the purpose of my stay is to say something ancient in a new way for the children of my children and anyone who seeks. Wild geranium, next to the other Chris. <laughs> used, <laughs> used for diarrhea, dysentery, any kind of internal bleeding and heavy periods. It is also used to heal cuts and wounds, ulcers and sores. It can also be used to astringe flaccid muscles, causing problems such as stress, incontinence, prolapse, and constipation, and also to dry up excess secretions, as in catarrh. When used as a wash on the skin, it is used for cuts, grazes, sores, and ulcers, burns, greasy skin, and blocked pores that cause pimples. <laughs> and Jack in the pulpit. <clears throat> the root was applied as a poultice on headaches, scrofulous sores, rheumatism, boils, abscesses, and ringworm. A decoction of the root has been used as a wash for sore eyes. The root was used as a contraceptive by the North American Indians. It's poisonous, so use with supervision. Sanctuary. What lurks in a corridor of trees? Paths that lead to foliage and lichen, lipping the rocks, forming small forests. There may be a labyrinth, an altar, a tree stump, a log, or an old chair to sit. Maybe planted flowers. There may be rocks and sticks placed in a mosaic or mandala. When at last you arrive, insects drone. Squirrels scatter leaves. The land speaks. As you listen, it may be frightening. It may call you. It may have something, something to say or nothing at all. In that silence, dark or light, you are not alone. The world among the trees holds roots of your longing. So all the plants have been talked about, and most of the poems are done. But I, I want to share this because I think this is probably the most important thing. I don't know if any of you have read Braiding Sweetgrass. I'm going to take a little water. Yeah. <coughs> um, a gift from my friend Linda back there that I received. Um, guidelines for an Honorable har Harvest, and Robin Kimmerer is the author. But Rosemary Gladstar also expresses this in her teachings. This is when you approach a plant anywhere, in the wild, cultivated. Know the ways of the ones who take care of you so that you may take care of them. Introduce yourself. Be accountable as the one who comes asking for life. Ask permission before taking. And this is really an important one. Abide by the answer. Never take the first. Never take the last. Take only what you need. Take only that which is given. Never take more than half. Leave some for others. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Use it respectfully. Never waste what you have taken. Share. Give thanks for what you have been given. Give a gift in reciprocity for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you, and the earth will last forever. So Betsy talked about ways you can um, help United Plant Savers, and uh, some of the percentages of the things sold today go to United Plant Savers as well as North Branch Nature Center. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the show inside the, the hall. Um, this was the show that I asked Sean if I could exhibit, and he asked me, so do you have any more art? And I said, well, I do. I'm working, I just started working on this Native American alphabet, and I'm up to letter M. He said, well, do you think you could have it finished by the spring when you do this show and I said okay and it was a great idea because I got it done I, I was able to finish it so 
what I did with this particular show is I did a small thumbnail sketch of it all to see how it was going to kind of feel, but then I meditated and I actually was surprised by the images that came after each meditation, morning after morning. I did one a day and they were primitive looking to me. I mean, these are so much more like exact and more formal almost, where those were just very childlike and because they were in alphabet, I just decided, let it go, let's just do it like that and and see what happens. So um, I got permission from Daniel Mormon, who wrote um, Native American Ethnobotany. This was the book that Julie Meadows lent to me. Um, I asked him if I could use all his wording, and he agreed to it, and so did the press, Timber Press. So all of that has been okayed. And um, there is a poem that goes with this that I want to read called Keepers of Medicine. Across the mountains and plains, buffalo, prairie dog, snake, I must call them. Search for the keepers of medicine. Ask to use what they unearthed from blessed soil. Their labor with mud-crusted hands cannot be measured. We have reaped the value of what they revealed in yellow dock dandelion and yarrow, the great medicines that heal, risking death as they spoke to rain and thunder, sang praises to sun, flared in rash, burned and coughed up blood in order to understand. They gathered knowledge for each landscape and leaf, knowing when to use a flower, when to use a root, which ones were asking to be chosen, chopped, boiled, swallowed in a brew. Years of trials, the great task of listening, through hunger, drought, and birthing children, they grew trust in the roots of autumn, spring blossoms, birds that move seeds through the air. Thank you. No, no. Um, Maggie mentioned, and I keep seeing it from here, the colors of your very simple alphabet yeah. from a distance are absolutely, and up close as well, but the character of them totally changes. Look what they do from a distance. The colors are just stunning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Carrie? Could you share about your efforts to connect with the tribes? Oh, right. Thank you. Share? Yes, I, I called um, in Washington, D.C. Um, there is the main headquarters for Native American tribes, like 291 tribes. I only used 26, obviously, because there's only 26 letters. But um, I am writing, I want to put this, I want to compose this into a book, you know, take all the words, take the images and make it into a book, but I don't want to do it without asking permission. So each tribe, I have two more left to find, um, and then I'm going to send them letters and ask their permission to use that particular letter with that particular plant. Mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing it up, I didn't put that in my notes. And anyone who wants to get to know, I mean, here's a plug, but I, I just realized this, someone mentioned it tonight about, I have a class Saturday on drawing botanicals. And if you do like the idea of drawing plants, I will be doing it at the Riverhouse Yoga with Lindsay Helwig, right in the second row. It's her place. Um, yes. <laughs> um, from one to three. Any other questions? Yes. I'm curious about the process of drawing and, and painting your plants. If you did, how much you did outside versus inside, if you brought anything in with you, if you took photos, that sort of thing. Okay, good question. Um, because it was raining so much, I did more photos. I did do sketching, and they're wet, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so I did do some, to, to get the feel of it, like you have to, you have to like draw it first. So I did do that, and then I looked at the pictures, and then 
I also referenced some. I actually, actually the Jack in the Pulpit was not there. Yeah. So I had to reference it and go through books. And fortunately, at United Plant Savers, they have a hugest library of medicinal plants that I could reference several of them. Yeah, just to get more, you know, specific. Gary? When I was a kid, I grew up in northern Pennsylvania, and when I was a kid, people in the winter, a lot of people I knew, they would run a trap line, and in the summer, they dig jing shang. We call it jing shang or shang. And, like, I never heard anyone say, like, you can only gather X amount, you know? They, everybody just knew, like, at the time, it was $40 an ounce, which was an incredible amount of money in 19. 75 or whatever and I'm wondering you know what kind of law are there any laws that say like even in Vermont you there's a limit to how much you can gather if you go out in the woods there's a law the convention and trade in endangered species um, governs at risk or endangered wildlife generally like tigers are on there too um, and it's administered in the United States by the Fish and Wildlife Service so yeah there are guidelines around it but it's poorly it's fully organized and um, like and nobody what, is actually, I yeah. don't know how much they're actually paying attention to how much is harvested. And so it, it doesn't cover things that aren't endangered though, right? So, yeah. They love people yeah. to do that question. And that's kind of the general way many things are taken <coughs> without knowing that they're taking too much and they're not being respectful. You know, I have the, the letter T out there Tobacco. You know I mean, how controversial that is? But that's the letter that came to me. And you know why? Because Native American people, and, and people today, because they know this, use tobacco as a gift back to the land when they take plants. And so I thought it was really important to use, because it was a Native American alphabet, that I would use tobacco because they use it for ritual and ceremony and as a gift. And it's not used to the detriment of the herb like we have overdone across the globe. It's not just in the US. Most people smoke, had been smoking and some had been smoking for millennia, you know, for, at this point. <laughs> yes? What was your inspiration for all those little figures in your drawings? Um, I, thank you, I, um, I just started looking at different tribes and looking at different pictures of each tribe. And when I went to draw, I would just remember which things I saw and just put them together. They're kind of like a combination of several things put into one image. Yeah, so references. And also knowing what it is to be an herbalist and what it takes to harvest and to carry and to stir and to, you know, all those things, yeah. I love, um, back to the little alphabet there, I like a lot of things, but I love with the alphabet how in, on several of them, there is no paint around the flower, and the flower is drawn with pencil, and then very lightly painted there. And it's so beautiful to see the sort of almost devotional line of, of the drawings. And I, there are several of them there, and the, the pencil is only used for the, the devotional little sketches that are of, of the centers of flowers that is really just beautifully done. Thank you. And, and it's very good. I they, know how hard it is to <laughs> the delicacy of the flower. And, um, coming from me, really thank you. <laughs> thank you. I probably didn't even look at him that closely. <laughs> 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 it really shows up particularly because those are the white areas. Those are the only white areas out there. And they have these beautiful little just uh, formation. <laughs> Love the flower. Thank you. Did I understand you correctly, Jesse, that you were there for just one week? Yes. This is the thing. I ran out of food and art supplies on day six. <laughs> because I was inside so much. I got so much done so quickly, there was no need for me to stay longer. You know, like I had... I just thought this was a work completed. And so yeah. I was like, okay, no food, no, I need green, purple, and white, and I have none of those left. And so <laughs> I, I just, 
I had just left. And I felt complete. It felt like it was, you know, it was a good time. Yes. I just yeah. want to note that all the, the alphabet, they're all women. Yes. You know, and I, I just want, I don't know a lot about herbalism, like tribal herbalism, but I guess, you know, with a woman's art as opposed to a male art, you know, it, no, that's actually, thank you for bringing that up. I called, I chose to call it Mothers of the Sun and, and have just females represented. Um, not to exclude men, but to make it just specifically for them. And, I, and when I write about it in, in the book and add that, I'm going to talk, I'm going to speak to that a little bit more. Um, Deb Sewell wrote this amazing um, quote about how Native Americans aren't even acknowledged for all that they did to find out how these plants work for us. We overlook them, it's not even talked about. And so that was my impetus for like, oh, this has to not only be an herbal alphabet, it has to be a Native American herbal alphabet to give honor to them. But I thought about women and children, so there's some children in there, um, how mothers and their children work together during the day and fathers are hunting and they could be doing herbs too. It's not that they don't, but it's exclusive to the women, this particular art, yeah. Yeah. Two, yeah. um, as far as choosing what to uh, do drawings of, do paintings, drawings of, did you have a preconceived idea of what plants you wanted to portray? Or did it, how much of it was preconceived and how much of it was what you found growing? Everything was what I found. I went with a complete blank slate. Like, I don't know what to expect. This you is had no what, idea what you were going to do. I thought I was, okay, so I never saw that film. In my mind, yeah. because I've worked at herb farms, like Zach Woods and, and Amy Goodman Keepers and different places, there's rows of plants. <laughs> and that's what I thought I was going to see. Yeah. And it was so different. I was in the middle of the woods in a yurt, mm -hmm. not a soul. And I just walked through and like would just see, you know, wild ginger. I was like, wow, look at that leaf, you know? Yeah. It was, it, it was surreal and, and amazing. And it would call me. They would yeah. call me. Except for the jack and the pulpit. Except for, but the, but the area did though. The area you walk by and it says jack in the pulpit and a little thing. And I kept walking and I'm like, Whoa, I'm going to go back to that. That's calling, you know? It wasn't the Jack and Paul time of year or something? Or was no. It? no. It was, and it was summer solstice. The trilling was there. It was, le it was the leaves were there. The leaves were there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Linda. Oh, what are those? Oh, on the, on the pieces? Yeah. You know what? I don't really have an answer for that. Other than I started thinking children. I started thinking as they were doing the alphabet, they could also look at colors and name a color at first. But then I didn't know where it was going to go, if it was going to be that or not. But since I started it that way, I ended it that way. You know, I just kept going with these blocks of color. And it kind of almost filled in space in a great way, so I just left it. Why did you sign them? Why didn't I sign them? Yeah, just out of curiosity. I have too many names, first of all. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I do. I have the, my name is Josephine. In Michigan, I go by Joe. It was Joe Ahe, and then I got here, it was Jesse Ahe. And then it was Jesse Lavasco. And too many names. And not only that, I did sign those underneath. If someone purchased those and they wanted to see who did them, they could find out. Oh, okay. Those are not signed. No. I don't like what it does. I personally like it without the person's name. I think it's distracting. You know? Yeah. For me. But if anyone else doesn't sign it. Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Thank you, everyone, for being here.